Hi everyone, and welcome to the Student Activities Conference. Uh, for this session, I'm going to be your presenter. Uh, my name is Clark Reed. I am the theater director at Snyder High School in Snyder, Texas. Um, today we're going to talk about building trust within your ensemble. Um, a lot goes into that and, and there's a lot of things you're probably already doing in that um, within this, but I want to just kind of share what we do here in Snyder and hopefully it can help you uh, build some trust in your ensemble and build your program and build your ensemble because trust is a super, super important thing um, within our, what we do in the theater. And if you trust everybody and if everybody can trust each other, uh, life becomes a whole lot easier and you get some amazing work out of your students and the students will work so much harder for you. Um, this, this workshop is direct is presented for both students and directors. Um, so throughout the work this, um, we're, I've got a slideshow that we're going to go over. Um, but we also I've also recorded some things of my students doing what we do and a few interviews with my students that uh, we'll share and we'll kind of edit them all together as I make this happen. Um, and so if it's a little wonky, it's because my editing skills aren't the greatest. Uh, but just bear with me and hopefully we'll get through all this together and hopefully you'll come away with some ideas on how you can build the trust and build those relationships with your kids. So getting started here, I've just kind of got the definition of trust. This is what Webster defines as trust is the confidence or reliability of someone or something. Now, trust means a lot of different things to a lot of people. When I ask my students this question, I get an answer, a different answer from every student uh, as to what it means to, what trust means to them and what it means to trust someone or to have someone trust you. Um, it's a completely different answer for every person. But I think in the theater, we really have to, it boils down to, we have to be able to rely on each other we have to be able to uh, feel safe with each other. Um, we have to be able to feel completely at home and be able to fully express ourselves, fully be our genuine selves with each other or else the company will fall apart or it won't be as tight and with that and with and won't be able to really fully be accomplish what they know that you can accomplish. We all know that our students can do far more than what, what we could possibly do. I always say my students are infinitely more creative than I'll ever be. And that's true. Um, but without the feeling of trust between them, without the feeling of trust between you and them and vice versa, um, they'll never you'll never fully experience what their true capabilities are so we have to be able to trust that other actor each actors are going to say their lines and do their actions and do their blocking the proper way uh, we have to be they have to be able to trust that their set builders have built them a safe and secure set that is exactly to what is needed for the play they have to be able, yeah, we have to be able to trust that our designers have designed costumes and props and lights and sound all to make sure that everything works together, right? Uh, directors have to be able to trust that their students are going to do that, especially with one act play. I mean, have you ever really thought that one act play is like the only team sport that the coach isn't allowed to be with them during? They're, when they're competing, like every other sport, coach is on the field or the court with them. We get to help them set up and then have to sit down and wait and watch them, it's on them. So it's a, the trust is a, is a big thing in what we do and it is so important to cultivate it and it is so important to build it and to have that solid foundation of trust that everybody trusts that we are safe and we are going to be able to accomplish what we set out to accomplish. So within trust is the ensemble and we can't have ensemble without trust. And 
a strong ensemble then creates trust. Um, a lot of students, you know, assume like ensemble means background role, but really it means just a group of people coming together to collaborative create as the definition is a group of individuals dedicated to collaborative creation working together to develop a body of work the key phrase there is collaborative creation so to truly build an ensemble everyone has to feel empowered and will and able to offer their creative talents and have them be explored in the creative process so we had so that bill that come goes back to trust they have to feel trusted that their creativity students creativity directors creativity whoever is allowed and and they're allowed to explore their creativity they're allowed to try to try new things and that was, we can collaborate if we don't trust each other if we don't trust our students if the students don't trust the director that creativity is going to be constantly halted because nobody feels that they are truly allowed to express that creativity and and freely express it and explore it um so it's really important and so building ensemble is key in building that trust and so that's what this whole presentation is all going to be about is as I go through the slides through the slideshow and you'll see some video of my students doing work and some interviews of my students do, uh, talking about the culture of trust and ensemble that we have created here at Snyder High School. And we just want to, I want to share it with all of you so that you can, you can experience what we experience. Um, it's a wonderful feeling to truly feel like you and your students and your assistant director and your parents have all created Sorry, I'm, the bell is ringing in my class as I'm recording this. I'm in my conference period and one of the bell ri bells rang. So anyway, um, the to in include your parents and include your students and include everyone, they need to feel like you're building an ensemble and to build that trust, it, it goes in so many different directions. So that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to, I'm going to go through my slideshow of things that we do in Snyder that have really worked for us. And you some of this stuff I, you probably do already do. Some you may find and pull it out or some you may say, well, that won't work for us. You just have to find ways that it works for you and your program and your specific situations. Okay, so the first set of stuff that we're that I want to talk about is how you can start to facilitate building trust between the students themselves. So, you know, not necessarily between you and the student or the students and you or your parents or whatever, but within the group of students you have building trust between them to where every student feels safe with every other student or every student can rely on every other student and so on and so forth um so building trust between students so what we do is one of the things that and through my interviews with my students and asking them about this um the number one response was warm-ups it kind of surprised me that our ritualized warm-ups and the things that we do pre-rehearsal and pre and at the beginning of classes were the thing that built the trust between them the most. Um, it kind of it kind of threw me for a second. I was like, really? It surprised me, but it is it is important. So not only do warm ups have the benefit of actually physically warming up the body and the voice and so on and so forth, but they also build trust um, amongst the kids because they're, it's something they're all doing together. So we do two different kinds of warm-ups uh, pre-rehearsal. We start our rehearsals at 7 p.m. and we usually don't actually start working till about 7.30. So it's usually about 30 minutes of warm-ups during our rehearsal time that we are doing warm-ups. Um, and in class, I kind of shorten it because we have a little bit of a shorter amount of time, but it still is essentially the same thing. So we do two different kinds of warm-ups. Uh, the first is the formal warm-up. Um, where we they all have a place on the stage or in the classroom that they go to 
when the bell rings or when we hit seven o'clock on the dot, my stage manager calls places and everybody goes to the place on the stage that they have designated as their warm up space. And we will do, then the, the first one is the formal, we'll do physical warm ups. A lot of times, you know, some jumping jacks and stretching, things of that nature. But then we go into the vocal warm ups. And we do your typical, uh, you know, sirens with brrr going. Um, we do our plosives, we work with our plosives first. But then once we get through those, we do, we recite Shakespeare. It's kind of a call and response of Shakespeare and high, heightened language poetry. Um, and so, you know, either me or a student leader will say a line of Shakespeare and then the company will repeat it back. And so it'll, you know, we'll do like a monologue, like to be or not to be, or uh, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, or uh, we are such stuff as dreams are made on, um, or, uh, you know, any, any Shakespearean monologue really works. Any good poetry, we use Robert Frost, we use Edgar Allan Poe, um, any of it works. Anything that's heightened literature. And we like this because instead of the silly little tongue twisters that they do, which those are wonderful and they're great and they definitely have a place, but the Shakespeare and poetry and heightened language and good literature gets the kids thinking in a higher order of, of thinking. It gets their minds focused to a higher level. And that's how we start. We start with these and we start with those warmups of them just reciting them all together. And one of the things that I end up doing is usually the second and third, maybe the fourth one, I have them pick up, kind of find a partner and face each other to where they are then, and I tell them, make it a conversation to practice that connection between actors and characters. So I have them make a connection with each other and have them talk warm-ups to each other. So we have them talk to each other face-to-face -face and doing their warm-ups. They still have to do full projection. They still have to do their over enunciation practication, but they must maintain full eye contact during the whole thing they're saying. And they're all talking at the same time. So they have to maintain full eye contact and they have to make it a conversation, but still using that full voice, that full warm-up voice that they're using. Um, and they tell me a lot of times that that really helps to help them trust with somebody and they'll find a different partner every time, just sitting there making eye contact and saying words of Shakespeare or lines of poetry to each other um, starts to build a bond. And if you do it multiple times throughout, that bond just strengthens and they feel more and more comfortable with each other as they are just staring each other in the eye. It's the eye contact is way important. <coughs> Excuse me. So after we do our formal warm ups, we move to informal warm ups. Uh, before we go to informal warm ups, Oftentimes with the formal warmups, I will have, I will either lead them or a senior student. Um, it's kind of an honor when I say, hey, you lead warmups today. They go, oh, really? I get to do it? Um, it's really exciting for them. And it's always, it's important that it's your seniors and your veterans that do the form, lead the formal warmups because that gives that, oh, gives every, all the other students, oh, I could work up to that. I could work up to being there. Um, so that's that's important and it shows that you trust them with your warm-ups that they will do it properly um then after so after the formal warm-ups we move to the informal warm-ups uh so students they will then what they'll do is they will gather up in a circle um and they do their little silly fun ones you know um i've heard of so many different ones throughout my time in different theater companies um and a lot of them are just gibberish, you know, fun, silly little warm-ups that they do. They've got motions with them and they kind of have dances and they're chanting and they're just having fun. Um, I encourage the, you to find ones for them and let them find them. Um, the ones my students do, I've never heard of until I, until I started working with them. And they find new ones every year 
that they like and they just bring to them and they start doing them. Um, so they're like little informal warm-ups um, and you'll see some video of them doing that here in a second. Um, and, and so they just all get together and they just have fun and they tell me in those interviews and you'll see those as well that they really feel like those help them fully feel safe with each other and it's amazing phenomenon to watch the the new freshmen they start off and they're all everybody around them is doing these crazy things in their warm-ups and the freshmen are just kind of sitting there withdrawn and circled up and just kind of going through the motions but then as as the weeks go on and as the days go on and they do it you see them really start to just fully express out because it makes them feel safe uh, as they keep doing it they feel safe and that is another thing that ha builds that trust between the students so here's a few here's some video of our students working uh doing warm-ups formal and informal and some video and some interviews talking about that Such a word. There would have been time for such a word. But tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Creeps in. The mighty fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Out, out. Well, a small one is warm-ups. It helps, it helps bring us together, especially when we do them together. When we have our circle ones, of course, that helps relieve some tension, obviously, after the big warm-ups, but it helps relieve tension and helps us relax, especially together. And then there's the, the secret dream. Well, whenever we warm up, we have these, uh, we have this time where we all get in a big circle and we do you know, two to four um, really silly things. There's just like a, it's like a song or a, or a chant more of a, or a dance kind of that we do together as a group. Uh, it's real silly. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, uh, there's no meaning behind it. The really only reason we do it, I think, is just to get our energy up for one. But I think it's really important uh, being in a circle, we're able to look at each other. You can see everyone at the same time. Uh, we're just kind of laying it out on the line, getting our energy up, and it's uh, it's very it's very fun. It's very crazy. And fully uh, expressing yourselves. And yeah, it really is. Uh, to be able to trust the students that lead that, uh, it's really, it really shows leadership. Whoever's leading it, it's usually upperclassmen to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a connection there too. They usually stand in the center of the circle, and they're able to look at each other. You know, whoever's doing it, they're not just standing in one spot looking at one person. They're mm -hmm. always moving around, connecting with each other, uh, looking, making eye contact with other people. Okay, so I hope those videos really helped you kind of see what we do and just kind of gave you a visual example of what, how we do our warm-ups to help build that trust and uh, that ensemble work. Um, a few other things that we do to build um, trust between the students is um, I do try to do a mentor-mentee relationship, um, establish that. Uh, I try to pair <clears throat> my upperclassmen with underclassmen or veterans with rookies. Um, so in this year, I've got a couple of sophomores actually mentoring that have been with me since my, my, their freshman year, and I've directed them previously in like community theater and stuff like that, and they know how I operate. So I've actually got a couple of sophomores mentoring a few of the freshmen and the rookies coming in this year. But typically you've got your juniors and seniors paired with your new freshmen and sophomores, depending on how your classes, how your program is structured. 
um, and you just tell them, hey, this is your this is your mentor, and you can go to them for anything. And then you tell the mentor, this is your mentee, this is your newbie. Get them comfortable. Be a be a shoulder for them to be on, uh, to rely on. Let them feel like they can come to you and ask you for help. If I if if we're doing something they don't understand or why we do something or anything like that, if they're a safe person that they can go and talk to. And that really helps to build the relationship with them. And just last night I went and backstage during rehearsal and I saw one of the new freshmen. He was just sitting just down and just really, really stressed because we're about to open a show. And he was just freaking out because he had made a couple mistakes and his mentor was right there just like, hey, it's okay. Everything's going to be fine. When you make a mistake, he'll call you out, but you know it's to make you better. And um, and so and it was just nice to see that they were interacting in that way and that mentor mentee relationship was there and that they were they were able to rely on each other so some other things that um we do to build up trust between students and each each between students together and the kids within your department is we have a few other uh little things that we do um the first two are uh were easier pre-pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has created a few issues when it comes to social events, but social events are important in uh, building trust. You know, hopefully the pandemic will get be done soon and we'll be able to ease more easily have our social events again. But um, we do two, diff two different kinds, the formal social events. Those are the ones that you organize as the director you know, and it's full department. Like we all go to lunch together from time to time. Um, you have your cast parties, um, banquets, things like that. Those big formal social events, you don't do them often, but you do them periodically. Um, those are so key to just getting everybody together for some fellowship outside of the workspace, outside of the school space. And they can, we can all see each other kind of more in our just genuine lives, daily lives. I mean, just put school away and put theater away for a little bit and just be socialized with each other. It's, it's real important that you make those happen. Um, informal social events. These are things that maybe you're, the, as the, the director, is not a part of. Um, the students organize those. Um, I know mine will oftentimes just send out a group text and say, hey, we're all going to lunch and they all go to lunch together. Or, hey, we're all gonna go have a barbecue at this guy's house and they go do that. Or they, we're gonna go to the sand volleyball courts at the park, and we're gonna all play volleyball. Um, they do this a lot. Um, that, and a lot of times I don't even know they're doing it until the next day at school and say, yeah, we were all playing volleyball. It's like, oh, wow, cool, that's awesome. Um, these types of things really help them get to know each other and to be their true genuine selves without any teachers or anybody around them to really uh to where they feel like they can't fully express them. you know even if a kid feels completely safe to fully express themselves they really won't a lot of they, they won't go all the way if they know you're around they won't you know they act differently amongst themselves but that helps to build the trust between the two, between them. And it's important to encourage those. As directors, I highly recommend you encourage those because the other thing it does is it breaks down the clicks. Clicks are gonna happen, they always do. Um, I don't know that there's a way that you can fully eliminate clicks, um, but, what you can do is by encouraging these, they all get together and for a few moments, those clicks break down. Clicks happen because people just hang out with people they prefer to hang out with. And that's just, it is what it is. We do it as teachers too, as adults. But we understand also that if somebody wants to come join our click, yeah, come on, you know? Um, and that's what you're trying to encourage. You're trying to encourage, yeah, those clicks may happen, but, they're all open and welcome to anybody coming and talking with them or hanging out with them. 
Um, so that's what those informal social events really do. Formal ones do it, do it as well, but without the adult supervision there, those, uh, they'll, they're more willing to, um, to do that, to fully express themselves and kind of learn how to break down the cliques and things like that and get to know each other better. Um, one thing that I do, and if your school allows you to do it, allow them to come eat lunch in your classroom. Um, we, we are a weird school and we have an open campus lunch where the kids can go off campus to go eat at a restaurant um they can eat in the cafeteria the student center um but if your school allows you to let them come eat lunch in your classroom let them come eat lunch in your classroom um or wherever your common area is um uh, i wouldn't recommend letting them eat in your auditorium because i have strict rules about that but go eat in the drama classroom um and that creates that fellowship and it creates like this is our space this is our sacred space where we can come and feel safe and if they're not feeling, because we all know theater kids are all a little different. A lot of them are different types and they don't always feel comfortable with the big giant student body in the cafeteria. So it gives them a place that they, a safe place to come. Um, and that helps build trust with, not only between the students because they can come have their own little lunch and fellowship in your classroom, but they can also build trust with you because you're there. You're, you're probably there eating lunch. Um, and you know, they can, breaking bread with people is a thing we've done for year or for many a millennia. That's an important part of bonding. Um, and so if you can, allow them to eat lunch in your classroom. Um, appreciation circles, these are huge in building trust for us. Um, and the kids love them. Now you do have to block off a significant amount of time to do this depending upon the size of your group. I've got a full big group. I've got 26 in my varsity level. Um, and so it takes us a really long time to do an appreciation circle. Um, you pretty much have to sacrifice an entire rehearsal period or an entire class to do it but it's so worth it. It is so worth it, especially when you're feeling like tensions are really high in your company um, and there's a little bickering starting to happen and little dramas are starting to appear. Um, it's really important that you set aside time to do an appreciation circle. Um, and really all they are is everybody I use my stage, but wherever you find is like a really good place that they can space and sit in a big giant circle and everybody sits on the floor. Um, if you can't, you know, you can sit, have some sit in a chair, but it's important that everybody sits the same way. And sitting on the floor is just really kind of an informal and, and just kind of opens everybody up and relaxes everyone. Um, but what you do is you just go down the line and you say, I want you to tell everybody, every single person, one thing you appreciate about them and why. Um, and it's it, it, the insights you gain into the kids and what they see from other kids. Um, and oftentimes tears start flying off and then we'll have big joyous laughters, but everybody walks away feeling a sense of camaraderie and a feeling a sense of love um, and that they truly are appreciated by every single person in the room. Um, it's way, way cool, and way important. Um, and it builds those relationships and it makes them feel like, okay, even though that person may not be in my immediate friend circle or we may have had some drama in the past or we may have had whatever, I know that they see that I am contributing something they appreciate what I'm contributing and my contributions are valued. So it's truly a, a powerful tool you have. Um, don't do it too often or it loses its essence, but it is a big thing that you need to set aside time to do, to do it every so often. For me, we do it, if a production is particularly stressful and we've got the time, we'll do it mid in the middle of rehearsal process but we always do it after a close of a show. Um, 
we often will do it. We always do it right before our district contest. Um, that's a big important one. Um, and then if we're in fortunate enough to meet, be moving on at some point in the one act play contest, we will do it in the middle of it. And then we will do it again at the very end of the school year. So I only do it maximum of five times a year, but it's, it's super important to do it at least once or twice. I would say at least twice is probably the best time because the minimum I've ever done it is twice a year, but I try to do it at least five if I can, but or a maximum of five, but uh, two is what I try to do at, at minimum. Um, another thing that helps build trust between students is pre-show and contest and pre-contest rituals. Um, we have several that we do here um, that are unique to our program. Create some for your program and do them religiously. Do them every time you do them. There's some pre or rituals that we do every rehearsal. Um, we have a poem that is very near and dear to our hearts here at Snyder High School called The Secret Dream. Um, and I won't say it all to you because it's our, it's, you know, we keep it here, but we say it before every rehearsal, every rehearsal. We all are in that circle. We hold hands and you'll, we have some video of it and I'll show, I'll show a little bit of it we all, they all sit in a circle, hold hands, and I stand in the middle and lead them in that, in that poem. It's a pre-show ritual that, or in a pre-rehearsal ritual that we say every day. Um, and it, because it embodies our program. So find something that embodies your program and have that ritual that you do pre-show every time. Um, it could be a prayer. It could be a, um, you know, a, some kind of warm up, some kind of fun thing that you do that's ritual, that is ritualistic in nature. Like you would do it the same way every time you do it and do it religiously. It builds more than you can think. So some of the examples that we do, I talked about our little poem that we do. Um, you know, we do uh, before contests, we do this thing um, that's kind of unique to Snyder called uh, the farmhouse where we play this specific song and we walk in a circle. And then when the chorus happens, we kind of join hands and dance, do like a circle kind of Irish dance type thing. Why is it, does it work for us? It just does because it's, it's ritual and it's there and it's what's expected and it's what we do and the kids love it. Um, and it just builds that bond and it builds that trust. Um, so find things that are unique to you, uh, things that are unique to your program, or create them and do them religiously. Do those pre those uh, pre contest rituals. So here are some examples of of us. Here's our like secret dream, um, just a little bit of it that we do, and just it's one of the things we do every single night, and it's so simple and easy. Um, it's not one of our big major ones, but it is something simple. So take a minute and watch this. Success. What does it look like? Bring, bring success in. And exhale it out. The secret dream. The secret dream. The hunger that can never be fulfilled. The hunger that can never be fulfilled. Come out to the late rehearsal and smell the lilacs. To come out to the late rehearsal and smell the lilacs. To have a play done as well as it can be done. To have a play done as well as it can be done. My dear. <clears throat> okay, so I hope that that uh, kind of showed you a little bit of kind of how we one of our rituals, just to give you an idea of what it is, um, even if you have no idea. Some of you, you may already have a ritual that you do. Keep doing it and explain to the kids why you do it and why it's important so that it, um, you can really build that trust up. Okay, so this next one, I want to take a, kind of go in a different direction and we'll see a little bit more of the interviews here um, in this section because I wanna talk about building the trust between the students and the director. Um, it's, it's super important that you can trust them and that they can trust you. Um, it's equally important. Yes, we all, all these, all of us teachers talk about, well, we can't trust our students, blah, blah, blah. 
you need to find a way to trust them or find a way to make sure that that trust is established between the two of you, between the students and between the directors and vice versa, that you can trust them and that they can trust you. It's equally important. Um, so some of the things that I have found that really builds the trust with the students and that they can trust me and that I can trust them is <clears throat> Number one, knowing the students knowing that you trust them immediately builds trust between towards you. So if you tell them you trust them and you let them go do something, there it's already there. Um, you you've established that trust. Now if they violate it, then you come back and you tell them that they violated it. And so these are. This is the things that I do, this list here, that helps, that is, shows that I trust them. And when they, they succeed in this, then that trust is developed between the two of us. So the biggest one, um, and I, I'm gonna name drop here uh, from TETA, Billy Dragoo talked about in one of his, uh, in his Building a Tradition of Excellence, it, it, it hits exactly of what we do here in Snyder is you empower your students to take ownership of the show and the program. It's their show. It's their program. It's the students that make a program successful. It's the students that make a show good because they're doing the work. Yes, you're guiding the ship as the director, but the students and students that are watching Take ownership of your program. Take ownership of your show um, because it's yours. So give them that power to have some creative input, to have some, that feeling of ownership. Like, yes, I want this place to look, or I want this to look nice. I want this to be good. I want this to be great. Whatever it is you're doing, empower them with the ability to take control of things and to do what they know. Um, so, and directors guide the ship. So let them take control of their creativity. And let them be free. Let them be free to create. Don't try, as a director, I think it's, it's, a, it's in some people's directing style it works, but I feel like with students and high school kids, some of them need you to tell them every single thing to do. It's a given, but a lot of them, even those that you think you need to tell them everything you do, if you give them a little bit of creative freedom, let them start, you know, start off small. Well, what would you do? Why don't you go work on that and bring me something new? Um, let them take control of their creativity. Give them leadership responsibilities. So like, like I said early, um, getting some kids to lead the warmups, um, getting some kids to lead uh, your, your rituals or whatever it is, those things, giving them some leadership responsibilities helps. Um, I have given this one, this year for personal experience, uh, with me, I have given a student, basically he is my stage manager and he runs the program. Uh, he has that ability. Um, he's, we, we, we did noises off and we built a full on rotating two story set and he spearheaded it and he figured out how to build everything. Um, he just, he asked if he could take control and I said, okay, go ahead. And he did. And I, I mean, I've watched everything he was doing and made sure he was doing everything right. And when he did wrong, I corrected him obviously, cause that's your job is to guide. But what they created and what they were able to do just being empowered to do that. So him taking the lead and kind of organizing the workforce and organizing the actors, I feel like I've, it's the weirdest feeling in the world. I feel like I did very little work um, for this show that um, we're about to open uh, because they took it from me and did it all on their own. And it's beautiful and it's great. And it's what the set they build is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and then they did the same with their, their acting. Some of the actors kind of took over and just kind of were like, let me figure this out. Um, in doing, and in fact, in getting some of these interviews ready, 
that you're you've been seeing i took i i said okay guys i got to film some of these interviews during class time one day so i would take a student and i would say so what you guys need to do i want you to be working out the problem spots in the show so where are our problem spots we identified our problems and i said okay i want you to go fix it and run it four times so run it four or five times and then go to the next one and then i'll come back and see what you did and in every case i would take a student in do our interview told them to work they were completely on their own they did it i went back in there they were working and then they showed me what they did and they had fixed the problems and they fixed them in more creative and innovative solutions than a lot of times you could ever think of um and it's so it, it's just it's it's amazing to see that and it and it works really well when you offer them that trust directors to fix the problems and and you've done this plenty of times and they know what you expect they will do it they will do it so it's it's all and you just have to be willing to let go a little bit and give them the trust i i know as it was one of the hardest things for me to do is to let go of control of my show. Um, but the thing is, you still have the control. You can always come in and say, nope, that's not working. Or if they fail, um, if they fail at it, well, all right, if they break your trust, okay, you've got to go back and you, we've got to start over and rebuild that trust. You know, so it's, it's there and it's a fragile thing it always is but that's how you this is that's what the result can be is if they are feeling trusted and empowered they will do a whole lot for you um and, and that all goes into let them help you direct your show sometimes you get into a situation or you're in a show and you're going i this isn't working i don't know what to do i don't know how to fix this i don't know how i want this to look we've all been there as a director right say okay guys you know what and be honest with them say i don't know what to do i don't know what to do here i'm i'm struggling with this what what do you guys think i'm going to give you some time to see what you can do to figure it out and then go work on something else and let them figure out that trouble spot or what you don't know what you're doing or you don't know what you want to do come back they've got something for you and it's probably a lot, and you i can admit when i let them do that it's nine times out of ten better than what i could have come up with so it's let them have some let them have owners that's part of getting ownership of your show and ownership of your program and showing that you trust them and when they succeed then you know that that trust was warranted and then they really appreciate you trusting them with your with with the show and it just built makes that bond and that trust even stronger I uh, talked about giving creative freedom, hold them accountable. You have to hold them accountable. If they fail, if they disappoint you, you they need to be told. And, um, one of my students told me, he said, you know, I love it when you tell us we're wrong. Um, believe it or not, they do. They like that structure. They like knowing that you, you're going to hold them accountable. You're going to tell them that's wrong or you did wrong um i have we've built a big enough trust and relationship here that when i say the word i'm disappointed in you their heads just drop um because that's it is so and the reason it works that way is because we trust each other and they know that when they have violated my trust and I am disappointed in them they know and they and then the next day is almost a hundred percent better um, and so you have to hold them accountable and it helps to it, it, it a lot of people think that when you uh, have this trust and you try to break it or you try to discipline or put that foot down um, that it kind of breaks the trust and they don't it that's not the case when you hold them accountable it it if it, it does nothing but strengthen the bond and strengthen 
It reminds them that, yes, you're still in charge, directors, but you still respect them. And it's better saying, I'm disappointed in you, is better than yelling and screaming and all that. Now, I know we all do it. I'm guilty. Guilty of yelling and screaming. It happens. Um, but they also know that when that happens, that they really have crossed the line. They don't even need me to tell them. Um, but, you know, that's part of it, holding them accountable. On the flip side, praise them for their successes. And it can be the tiniest little thing. If you have a kid that is just struggling with everything and they do one thing better, praise them for that. Praise them for it. Um, and it can be from that smallest thing, oh, you got that line right for the first time, so good, awesome, to best actor awards, or placing at state, meddling at state, whatever. Praise them for their accomplishments. Um, that uh, coupled with holding them accountable and letting them know when you were disappointed in them is just such a strong bond builder. Um, one thing that I do that helps to build trust is I'll take time periodically during a class or a rehearsal and just call kids up. I, usually it's like a group, like recently I just did my new freshman. Um, take time to periodically speak to each student individually and discuss their, progr their progress in your thing, how they're developing, what you think they're doing good at, what you think they can work on better, and then really to just check in on them and say, hey, you doing okay? Um, you do, how are you doing? What are you, uh, is every, you handling things okay? You handling the stress? Um, how's things at home? Are you doing all right? Just checking in. It means the world to them when you sit there and, and say, I care about you and I want to talk to you and I want to hear what you have to say. Um, and students that are watching, we love it when you come talk to us too. Um, we really do. We want you to come. We love you. Um, and we want you to come and talk to us. We want you to feel safe. So that's another thing that you can do to build trust, to take time and periodically speak individually with kids. And one thing that I do um, that means that every single one of my students has said means the world to them um, is at the end of each rehearsal or class, tell them you love them. Um, we love our students. I mean, most of us really do. Our, our di directors, we love you. We love students. And the students love you. But it's important that you tell them. No matter how mad you get, no matter how disappointed you are, or angry, or stressed, at the end of every rehearsal and every class, tell them you love them. Now, I do it kind of jokingly. I say, I love you. I love you. Get out. Um, but it still means something to them. Um, tell them you love them. It's important for them to hear that. It's important for them to hear that you love them, that you're thinking about them, and that you care about them. Um, and tell them nightly, tell them daily, tell them that you love them. Because some of them may not be getting told they're loved, but if they know that you love them and that you're genuine about loving them, they're gonna be there for you. They're, you're gonna, they're gonna, be your champions and they're gonna champion you. Um, and students, you can tell us, we wanna know that, we, that you enjoy us being there. So, and that's all part of building trust, building trust between students and directors. Uh, here's a few clips of some of the interviews between me and my students um, talking about some of those things that we just talked about, creative freedom, holding, us, holding them accountable and uh, you know, checking in with each other. Um, I think that like letting me lead warm-ups and being a leader of this company and being able to take a group of people and teach them how to do things, um, you know, without your supervision, you know, um, like working like a fight scene, you know, you've been able you've been able to trust me to work that carefully and safely because I know how to do it and you know that I know how to do it. Okay. Um, I think for like building a company aspect, you know, have those little things like the warm ups that we do, you know, and let the students lead it. You know, it doesn't have to be the director because then that gives the students a sense of responsibility and leadership. Um, 
and then you know that gives younger classmen the chance to you know I'm super excited to work up to that point to where I can do that um, and in a director to company aspect I think um, letting them run scenes by themselves like you're doing with us letting us take responsibility and leadership to be able to direct a scene and fix the problem spots and do it correctly and maturely without you having to worry about us going and doing something and then completely undoing what you did and just making it worse. We've taken what you're doing and fixed it even better, you know, and added our own personal little things that we would have added. So I think, you know, and then just being open and being able to communicate with everybody and having, you know, like our... Um, appreciation circle those are super important because mm -hmm. you know a lot of people are like oh you know yeah I appreciate that person but sometimes some people really need to hear it in mm -hmm. specific moments mm -hmm. you know especially stage managers they are under stress constantly the little I appreciate you and what you're doing goes a long way mm -hmm. I just mentioned like the courage to make your character you but then working with others to build those relationships and to work together basically just be able to have that trust and confidence in each other to come up to someone and be like okay this is how I'm playing this person and I'm gonna work with you to work with your character and let's get together after school to run run our lines and work through these scenes that you know mean our little heart for us and then you work with everyone around you not just actors but with your crew on how they do things and I love Kyle he's super cool <laughs> I really like uh, Farmhouse. Farmhouse feels like a, um, kind of like a thing of family. Like, you know how you have family get-togethers and then people will, like cry to each other and talk with each other? It feels like something that uh, just a family does. Like, it's our thing. That's something we share. And so you get this connection that you don't have with anybody else. And then we also do, uh, uh, like we did that, um, that one exercise last year where we took, a, took an emotion and, um, went all the way with it and we did that in a big group so everyone was feeling it all at the same time and so you felt okay to be emotional and vulnerable and show people because everyone else was too you could see everyone's emotions and so you felt okay doing it yourself and then we all understood that this was just something for us mm -hmm. but we you know if you saw something then that was you had that trust in each other that mm -hmm. it was just between us and you could see the person To, to really do what you would expect the other person to do. So like, I don't know, whenever, you're, if you're on stage and the director leaves, even for a little bit, just to take a phone call, just keep working, keep, really work at making what you're doing good. Don't worry about doing it good for your director. Don't worry about doing it good for each other. Do it because it's good. You know, even when it's just you alone, work to make it good for you. And then it makes it good for everyone else. Beautiful. Like whenever we do our little warm-up thing where we do our um, acting and like you're just as weird as you possibly can mm. and it just helps you get out of your bubble and feel more comfortable. Like nobody's going to judge you. You're just a big, huge, weird <laughs> Theater company. kid. Yeah. We're all one for all and all for one. Like, nobody is going to know this is your family. It's because we're all one view and we know exactly what you expect and what is expected of us and okay. what we should do. Excellent. I think just like our secret dream, just that moment of silence that you're all together and you're just all together and everybody trusts each other and it's really just a family. And okay. You've pulled me off to the side and you have told me like, I'm so proud of you. Like you were gonna do an amazing job and like, I can't wait to see how you grow. And it just means a lot knowing that you trust me and this, especially being my second year, like you, 
believe in me so much. You love your kids and it shows in everything you do. Like you prove to your kids every single day that you love them and you tell them that every single night. Okay. I do tell y'all I love you every night. Um, it is important to me. No matter how mad you are. Yeah, no matter okay. how So mad. Um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about, about getting kids to buy in or getting kids to build on Ensemble and to kind of help build that trust um, and building the Ensemble, building the program, making them take ownership is you got to get them to buy in, right? How, all right, so yes, oh, all right, Clark, that's great. That's all right, Reed, that's great, wonderful. All that stuff is wonderful, but how do you get them to buy in? You got to get them to buy in. These are the ways that has worked for me, um, and I know they've worked for other people because I've heard them talk about it. Um, mottos and, number one, mottos and slogans. Uh, kind of a simple, silly thing, but... You know, uh, again, I'm going to name drop Billy uh, in his, Billy Dragoo in his uh, TETA um, can, uh, workshop about building a tradition of excellence. You know, you have to, he said, you have to operate your program as a business. And that's so true. Um, and every business has a motto and a slogan, or they have some, or a jingle, something. Um, so we have mottos and slogans. And, um, use them find them that are unique to you some things that the kids like or that you like that mean something and get them all going if you if you say something long enough it will become a motto if you say something long enough it will become a slogan and um that when you get those down and though and they really should kind of define your program your mottos and your slogans they should be just a simple short thing that defines the program um, we have about three that we use, um, and they, they just kind of define us, um, and, that's, and that's what we are. Um, so mottos and slogans. Lead by example. Um, if the kids see that you are, are giving every part of yourself, that you are sacrificing your time to make it, to do good and to make things as good as they possibly can to offer them the best chances for success that will get them to buy in you have to lead by example um you know i have a one uh, a, a son that's about to turn one years old one year old um so i they know i'm sacrificing a lot of time with him um to be with them for hours on end to get their stuff better so if if they know that you are sacrificing a lot they will sacrifice a lot to, to be there with you. Um, and get down in the trenches with them. Um, show them that you're not afraid to get up there and act a fool uh, when you want them to do something. Uh, when you want them to expand their character, get up there and show them what you want to do. Lead by example. Um, you know, if, you know, work on the set, you know, lead by example. Um, this one's big and be your genuine self. Um, my kids know that I'm, I'm true, I'm genuine with them. Um, you know, they don't need to know everything about you. They don't need to know every gory detail of your life, but they need to know that you're a human being. They need to know that you're a real person. Um, and kids today are very perceptive and students that are watching, you know this, you know that which teachers are being their true selves and which ones are, are kind of putting on a show. Um, kids are really perceptive and it's important to be your genuine self. Um, they know when you're not um, and they will, they will respect you more and they will be more willing to buy into what you're selling if you are genuine and true to who you are and just being a human being, not this stereotypical teacher type. Be who you are, be a human being, it helps. Um, make your space, whatever it is, be it a cafetorium, an auditorium, a classroom, um, a green room, whatever, make your space a second home for them. Um, our, I let my kids just kind of, in our, we have two classrooms here. I've got an actual classroom where everything happens and then I've got kind of our, what we call the drama lab. It's where we just make things. It's kind of our, our base of operations. Um, and it's our, it's their second home. It's just decorated with random stuff 
from the kids, from other shows. Um, it, it, it's random. I had a teacher walk in and go, you know, this room is really kind of cluttered and random, but it feels like it's at home. It's a home. It feels really comfortable and homey. Uh, and that's why. It's because it's just, that's what it is. We've made it a second home. It's where the kids can come to feel safe. A lot of them come and eat lunch in there. Um, that is what it is. It's where it's, it's home. It's their second home. Make your space a second home. That'll help the kids buy in. Uh, build tradition. Um, Snyder, we are fortunate. We have a rich tradition and it goes back a long way. Um, and you build traditions. Um, what are things you do every single year that are fun for the kids? Um, our traditions go way back. Uh, there are some that I use that were still were done when we're during worship's time. Uh, and then there are some that I do that are mine that I've brought with me. Um, so what are some traditions that you do? Build tradition that uh, can come along and that the kids expect every year, oh, it's, tra oh, it's time to do the tradition. It's time to do the tradition. Um, what is it? Build tradition. Um, and, and that will really help them kind of buy in and want to be a part of it. Uh, I think it's a really important to educate them on the history of the program and remind them of it constantly. Um, our history is very rich here. Um, and I we have an archive full of old, old photos. I mean, we've got photos that go back to the 70s and six, 60s and 70s. Um, we have our competition history posted on our walls. Um, I've added, we, we just recently added, when I came in, theatrical design and film, and I put that history on the walls. Um, I mean, we have, we, we established, and I highly recommend uh, everybody do this, we established a hall of honor um for our our distinguished alumni and i have a group of people that get together and we talk about who we're going to induct that's an alumni from our program and they get a big plaque that we put on the wall in the lobby of the auditorium and it just adds to it it grows and grows and grows every year um that's important for the kids to see that people from your school have gone on and done great things um if you're at a new school your history may be a little more limited, but you can start to build that. You have the unique opportunity, if you're at a new school, to start the history and create the different types of things. And so educate them. You, you're the perfect expert on the history of your brand new school. So, um, but it is important that you see, to get them to buy in, they need to see what came before them. Uh, we have a wall in the auditorium um, of bricks of that former students have painted at, at their, the end of their senior year. It's like a living history. It's beautiful. Um, it goes all the way back to like the oldest one I found is like 1973. And this, this wall has survived renovations. Um, and it's something that's been kept really kind of sacred here. But the oldest brick I found that people have marked on was 1973. And it was just it started out as just little pencil tags, and then it kind of evolved into art. Uh, all these bricks that are just wall art, um, and it's just kids kind of tagging. They get a brick in the auditorium when they graduate, and that's a living history um, that you can start, that you can do. That kids are like, "Oh, I can't wait to get my brick," uh, and I'll buy, and they'll buy in to to keep it going. Um, proudly display awards and achievements. Um, our auditorium, our lobby of our term has all of our trophies in it and the kids see them every day. Um, we have medals that we just kind of hang around from different things that we've collected. Um, proudly display that stuff. Um, it, and it's not only does it remind your kids of what success can do, but it also can help build your program. Oh, hey, that's a successful program. Uh, kids want to come and be a part of something that's successful. So awards, achievements, and don't have to be one act trophies. It can be anything uh, that you're particularly proud of. Uh, display that, display it. Uh, decorate common spaces or classrooms with relics from previous shows. I 
I talked about this and making this place a second home. Like I've got masks from our last show on the wall. Um, we've got just random props that are displayed. Um, just random, random things, random. You know, a lot of people like to take a souvenir home from a show. That's kind of a tradition in the theater. Do it, do it in your classroom. Just take something from the show that has significance to that show and plop it somewhere. And that way we're, we're always reminded of, of, of history. It goes back to the history. It's how you can build that history. <clears throat> when you're talking about um, bonding and building the program and getting them to buy in, um, and I know this isn't necessarily possible for everyone out there, but if you can make it happen, it'll really truly help. Go on trips to conventions, clinics, et cetera, and overnight trips really help. If you can, can, if you can do a couple of overnight trips, the bonding of your company will just explode. And it really will, and it's a way you can get the kids to buy in. It's a way you can get them to learn to trust each other. Um, and, and it's a way you can learn who you can truly trust as a director and who the, that the kids can trust you um, because you know you become their parent on that end like you're their you're their provider when you go on a ch overnight trip with them so then they have to rely on you and you have to be able to trust them to to do what's right and be right and you know on that overnight trip when you're asleep so uh it's 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 a huge thing and i highly recommend it and then there, and it's fun. Like going to thespians convention is fun for the kids. They love it. Going on a clinic, just the trip there. We always, I always try to schedule a clinic that is far away. That is like four or five hours away to where we are forced to spend the night. And so I, I we go on a clinic, we do our thing and we go have fun. Um, we go have fun after our, we do our clinic. We go, uh, one year we went to Medieval Times. Uh, we went to, I can't remember what it was called, but it was a place that has bowling and games and all that stuff. Um, I think it was shenanigans in the Dallas area. Um, but that stuff, that stuff gets the kids to buy in because it gives them something to look forward to. Um, and just them have, being able to have that kind of fun and to relax and let everything go and play for a little while, it does wonders. Um, so if that's a possibility for you, I highly recommend you do it. Um, it will, it, you will see a, a true change in the kids and they will appreciate it so much um, when you get, when you do that. Um, and, and I realize it's not always possible for everybody, but um, it is something you, you, you can try to do. Um, and then the other thing that we do here, uh, make them feel special and unique by displaying headshots in the school to publicize your shows. So like we, you know, I've seen them done where they do, they have professional headshots done and they, you know, put them and uh, they display them in the lobby or out in the hallway with their bios. Um, I have a great group of parents. I have a booster club, um, which that is a good thing. If you can get a booster club, kind of a little side note, or get a booster club going and get a few groups of dedicated parents. It's going to help you a whole lot. Um, but I have a I have an, a mom that's awesome with like Photoshop and marketing, and she comes and one night one rehearsal she's like, "Can I pull some kids to take their picture?" Sure. So she pulls, she takes her picture one at a time. Nothing too spectacular in the photography world, but then she takes those pictures and she makes a unique poster for every kid. Um, they with their name and make, puts this nice little graphic on it and uh, their role. And, and the kids love it. And it, we post them in the hallway and all their peers walk by and they see that they see their, they see these kids in their picture and that they're doing this show and it looks all professional and nice and neat. And um, they feel special. Our, my, the, my students that are in the show feel special. They feel like they, they have something that, yes, we, we're cared about enough that we get this. And it makes them feel really special. Um, and that helps with the buy-in and the trust and the building of ensemble. And they, they feel like they've got a little fraternity. Um, and so it's, it's important to do something like that. Um, 
and it and if you can get your ma your drama mamas as i call them to to if you can get a group of parents to do that for you it's going to make your life easier and it's one less thing you have to worry about because you know your moms will take care of it um and that's a way you can really start to build that relationship and that trust with your parents is to get a group of them together and work with them, get them, ask them to do stuff. They'll do a lot for you. Um, and there's a lot of parents that really want to be there. Um, so, you know, try to establish a booster club if you can, if you can't do an official booster club, um, do what you have to do. Teachers, please excuse Sorry, we got interrupted by an announcement. I'm, as I said, I'm doing recording this during my conference period. So um, I apologize for, for the interruption of announcement. I'll try to edit it out as best I can. Um, anyway, so just, just these are some examples of things that we do to get the kids to buy in and to really help. And if you get them to buy in, then you can get them to start to trust you, trust each other, and that ensemble begins to build and you can collaboratively create. Uh, so <clears throat> these are the examples. I uh, talk about the mottos and slogans on the last slide. These are the th these are the ones we use. Um, we we do esprit de corps. Uh, the the definition of feeling of pride, fellowship, and common loyalty shared by the members of a particular group. We break that down. It's simply all for one and one for all. Um, and I say esprit de corps. The kids will say all for one and one for all. Is and and. That's kind of our, our, one of our mottos, um, because it is. No one person is greater than the other, and if one of us fails, we all fail. If one of us succeeds, we all succeed. So um, it's, a, it's, it's super, it's a wonderful thing that we do with, the, um, with these slogans, and it's one that defines us. And as I said, you want your slogans and your mottos to define your program. Um, the next one we do is fun through excellence. Um, the kids, a lot of the, like my new ones, they go, I don't know what that means. And I, what does that mean? Um, because a lot of times, you know, you get drama kids together and they get crazy, right? Uh, they, they just, they have these big personalities and they're just zany, zany, zany. And sometimes you have to rein them in. Um, and so one of the things that I tell them is fun through excellence um, is yes, yes, we're going to have fun, but we're going to have fun because we're good at what we do and we've worked hard at what we do. And when you get the result of what you have done and worked really hard, then you realize, oh, that was so fun. That, that, thrill, of, that thrill of success and having a show done well, um, that's fun through excellence. Um, so basically what it, what it means is we're gonna work our tails off to do the best we can, and that is going to make it fun. Um, so, and when they know that they have done an absolute best job that they could, then they realize that the work is actually fun. Um, and so, you know, we we always we say have fun through excellence. So work hard, and you can have fun while working hard. Um, and then the one that's kind of the truly defining one that we do, and it's part of the the secret dream poem that we taught that I talked about earlier. It's a quote from it. It says to have a play done as well as it can be done. Um, and that is truly the defining, sorry, as I said, the bells, um, that is truly the defining um, motto slogan of our program. It's on the back of our t-shirts uh, to have it on every shirt we ever make, everything we ever put out, it's in there to have a play done as well as it can be done. Um, that is the most important thing of our department and it defines us. So it's again, a slogan, slogans and mottos should be short and easy to define. And that kind of gives that unity within the program to make it strong and build it strong. That way, everybody in that program knows this is what we're trying to do. This is the point. Um, and so with these, a lot of times I'll do a call and response. So I'll say the first half and the kids speak the second half. So I'll say all for one and they'll go all and one for all, or I'll say esprit de corps and they'll say all for one and one for all, or I'll say fun through and they say excellence, or I'll say to have a play and they say done as well as it can be done. 
So it's just, that's how you build it in and that's how you get it um, in there. Um, so we'll show you a few other um, more little snippets of our interviews and things like that to kind of round out this session. Uh, so um, just kind of, just to get you an idea of how the kids feel about all the things we do here in Snyder. Okay, and to, just to kind of wrap it up and to conclude, um, building trust, it takes time and you have to be consistent and you have to be regular with it and it takes time, it won't happen overnight. You can't say, all right, we're gonna start trusting each other and then the next day everybody's in this perfect hunky-dory trusting perfect world. It doesn't work that way. And even if once you have done, spent time working on it and building it up, um, it still fails from time to time. And that's the reality. Uh, but you, if you've got it established and if you're consistent with it, when it does fail, it's easy to repair. Everybody talks about how trust is, is it takes a long time to build and that's true. And it's, it takes an instant to destroy and is almost impossible to get back. That's, all, that's part true. It doesn't take long to mess it up, but if, the, if you have previous relationship of trust and previous understanding of what this is, then it can be repaired much quicker. Um, but you must take time um, to build the ensemble. You must take time to build trust. You must be consistent. Um, these are all, all the things I've gone through are pretty much everything we do that I could think of that builds trust and ensemble. And I think it's one of our true strengths here. And that's why I wanted to do a workshop on this is because maybe that's what you're struggling with. Um, you know, we can do, you can go into workshops of all the little detail things of all the different things that people do. But I wanted to do a big broad picture one, like, and what is one of the things that we do well that makes us have some success? And it's, and I truly feel it's the relationships I have with my kids and that trust and that ensemble building and the relationships that they have with each other. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. Got to keep at it. You got to keep working at it. But if you do, you'll, you'll find some, some real magic um, and some real true relationships. And, and just when you have that with your kids, it's truly magical. And it's, uh, it makes you go, this is what being a teacher is all about. Um, so thank you for um, watching today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope we gave you something that you can, can use and work with. And if you, as always, if you have any questions or want some clarification or want some advice or anything, or just want to say hello, uh, there's my email address, uh, cread at snyderisd.net. Uh, I love talking with my fellow colleagues around the state. We're so isolated out here in Snyder and West Texas. The nearest town is an hour and a half away in any direction, the nearest decent size. So we feel isolated a lot from our theater colleagues and our uh, theater educator colleagues and our other theater students. So reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you um, and I'd love to chat with you. So um, thank you again for, uh, for being here and I hope to, to meet you or hear from you and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you again. Bye-bye.